Welcome back to Wednesday webinar. And this week it's really kind of exciting because just, I guess, when was it, Mike? A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Greater New York meeting, walking through the hall, and I saw Mike there, Dr. Tischler, and he had with him a series of models, and he had this kind of enthusiasm going. He wanted me to stop. And I was running, I said, I'd come back, and then he stopped, and we got talking. And he showed me some really remarkable work. And we wanted to share this with you, and he was really just great, because he agreed to do it immediately with you. And our enthusiasm from you know, our point in sharing this was he's dealing with an age-old problem. Anybody who's been involved with dentistry has lived. You know, we all do the full arch uppercase or lower case. And we've done it a multitude of different ways. You, you know, look back to our Branimov days, Mike, and we did them as hybrids. We did them with bars, and then we had acrylic teeth on. I'm still having acrylic teeth come off. Then remember we had those overdentures, and you try to decide what kind of attachment to use. No matter what kind of attachment you use, you were somewhere going to have to replace it. And if that happened in the middle of your busy schedule, it was an ongoing nightmare in your practice. And we kind of evolved, I don't know if you did it, to force and fuse to metal, you know, ceramic metal bridges. We tried to do them screw retained, and that was pretty cool, except the screw holes invariably came out in different places. I was lucky Maurice got them to come out the central fossa, but of course that's where my occlusion was, and unless you brought the chimneys all the way to the top, I was having force and fracture down there. You have, I'm sure, much the same thing. I mean, we were just talking about it. We kind of then evolved into utilizing custom abutments and a ceramic metal or force and fused to metal uh, case that we cemented temporarily. And that those in turn came with problems. So we're still living all of this. And he showed me really an exciting way that he circumvented this and he's now actually done, what have you done, Mike, about 50 cases? Yeah, this year I'll we'll do uh, 50, 50 arches of the uh, Portal Zirconia Bridge. But you're doing and 50 just to be your own, you're doing what, another 50? Well, I just looked in the lab. We we have 50 bins of outside cases going right now from across the country, um, and some of those are two arches. So we 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 have quite a few arches going. I think the advantage to our laboratory with this uh, with this zirconia bridge is we're doing a lot. So we're, we're an incubator for any issues, and we've kind of resolved a lot of uh, the problems. Um, we've we've come up with techniques, and this webinar uh, that we're giving on XP, which by the way, thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, we, we really appreciate we really you thank guys you do. for it because you guys do. it really is an issue um, that we all have. And our, our big deal, of course, is to increase predictability and really the simplicity. You, you, everyone's going to look and say, no, this is kind of complex. I, I would say it's not complex, it's sophisticated, but you've made it actually very much easier for us. Well, it is. It's, um, we've broken down the steps. And the fact that you're going to go through the same steps that you have pretty much with bar overdentures, which I, you know, years ago I had a two-day lecture on how great bar overdentures are. And I talked about ceramic uh, PFM uh, cement retained bridges for years, and I did many, many arches. What I'm holding here with this zirconia uh, fixed detachable bridge, in, in my opinion, um, has every advantage um, that you can have. It doesn't, it, it will not break. I just saw Enrico Steger lecture on Saturday at the prosthetic meeting in New York. He said, this will be here for 5,000 years. So, you know, we, our lab offers a five-year warranty. And, you know, maybe I should put 5,000 years. Yeah. Um, it's that strong. And what, we're, what we've kind of mastered is the, the facial uh, of our prosthetics that we're doing, we don't have any, any porcelain on there. This is full contour zirconia. Yeah. And we, we, we can put some porcelain here, but it's so strong. It's so beautiful. And in my lecture, you're going to see how we treat and plan this, uh, the prosthetics, the surgical aspects. There are some surgical nuances uh, for this, and the laboratory steps. Yeah. So, Mike, I'm not going to 
hold back anymore. I mean, stop everybody else from hearing you. So go ahead, and then I'll be here at the end so we can field some of the questions. I'm going to be watching this now for the second time. So really, welcome all of you, and really, thank you. Bye. Welcome back. Thank you, David. Good. Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Tischler, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday on Dental XP. And what I'd like to do today is talk to you about the Zirconia CAD CAM screw retain bridge that we've been utilizing in our practice with uh, great success for about the last year. And we're going to cover uh, every aspect of this. And I want to thank XP for such a great venue. Uh, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. What I'd like to do today is cover the background and a perspective on where this zirconia screw retain implant bridge um, falls into the other choices that are available in uh, dental implant prosthetics. Then we'll talk about the treatment planning, uh, the surgical aspects, and then the prosthetic and laboratory aspects of providing this incredible uh, prosthesis to your patients. So let's start with the background. And one of the things that in our office that we look at, and by the way, I practice in Woodstock, New York, about two hours north of New York City, in the beautiful Catskill Mountains. And we have patients that come in and they have this situation where they have a few teeth that poss possibly can be saved. But we ask our patients and ourselves, you know, where do you want to be in five years? You know, what's going to last the longest? And the more we ask ourselves this question and looking at, look at situations like this, we come to the conclusion that an implant supported prosthesis is, is the answer than trying to save teeth that are questionable. And also, when we look at the zirconia screw retain prosthesis, we find that to be uh, the best choice. And I'm going to show you why during this presentation. So you take a situation like this where there's multiple teeth that have had endo and, and posts. And then if you look at the different options of what it would take to place implants where the patient is edentulous, uh, weigh how um, likely those teeth are going to be there in five or ten years, you know, often, more often than not, it comes to the conclusion that the patient is better off with a dental implant uh, supported prosthesis. We're also looking at the patient with regard to uh, their aesthetic demands. We're looking at the occlusion and the lifestyle that they live as far as the appointments that are needed. So there's a lot that goes into treatment planning. But we're talking about replacing either one arch or both arches, and, and that's what this presentation is about to lay the framework on why we feel that this screw retain zirconia prosthesis is, is really one of the best options available. So let's look at what's available right now in implant dentistry. Well, we have a implant supported over dentistry. Connected by a bar. We could do a cement retain implant bridge. We can do an acrylic hybrid uh, screw retain bridge, or we can do a porcelain fused to metal screw retain bridge. And then the last choice, which I'll be talking about uh, pretty much the rest of the lecture after I cover that briefly, is the milled zirconia CAD CAM uh, screw retain bridge. So a two implant overdenture is certainly not the most stable choice for a patient. First of all, it's, it's unstable, it's supported mostly by tissue, and when the denture is supported by tissue, eventually the bone is going to be lost under it, and then as this denture moves, it's going to put stress on the implants. The advantages to this option is, is that it's inexpensive, it's simple prosthetically, um, certainly easy to clean, there's only two implants and you can remove this, and it is a very simple surgery. This is an option mostly for elderly people or people that are medically compromised, but really not the most stable option. The next option is to place four or six implants and support an overdenture. Now realize when you place implants for an overdenture, if you're going to splint them with a bar, which is, which is better according to the literature than, non -splinting, than not splinting the implants, but it requires a certain amount of prosthetic space between 13 and 20 millimeters in the literature. And this space has to allow for the attachments, the bar, uh, the teeth, and the acrylic itself. The advantages of a bar retained 
um, a bar splinted overdenture is that the implants are stabilized by the bar, and any time you have implants that are stabilized by a bar, or, or in any way, um, it's, it's more advantageous. The bar supports the prosthesis more than the tissue. As Mish calls it, it's an RP3 uh, prosthesis. The, there's increased retention, and there's increased longevity of the implants when you splint implants. And one of the main points of a bar overdenture that is important is that you can provide the patient with second molar occlusion. Um, and we're, we're going to be talking about the screw retain um, bridges that have a cantilever, but really only offer up to the first molar um, if we're going to place uh, six implants on the, on the maxillary arch and five on the, on the lower arch. But the question we ask is how important is that one extra tooth? And the trade-off between having something removable versus having something that's fixed with one less tooth. And the shortened dental arch uh, is supported in the literature, whether it be second premolar or first molar occlusion, and the patients uh, can survive very well with this. The disadvantages of a splinted implant supported overdenture is increased costs, and we find that the cost of providing a bar overdenture is similar to the cost of a zirconia supported screw retained bridge. There's more difficult hygiene when implants are not, uh, when implants are not splinted. Uh, the increased pros prosthetic space that's needed is a disadvantage and requires more surgical intervention. There's often difficulty with parts and replacing those parts, and there's a lot of maintenance involved with these bar over uh, with all the different attachments involved. It is partially tissue supported, so it really is a cantilever. And then the bar design itself is a cantilever also. So we're not totally getting away from cantilevers. So when you see a bar like this that, I, that I've done in my practice for many, many years, it's a wonderful modality in some sense because it does offer the patient the availability to chew, eat, and smile. This is a maxillary bar with a slight cantilever you can see. And these are locator attachments. And these are locator attachments that go into the males. Now over time, we found over the years that these have to be replaced uh, once a year or more. So there is maintenance involved. Uh, there is instability involved as they wear out, and that instability um, over time translates to further prosthetic issues and possibly even implant um, issues. But it does provide a service. We just don't feel that it's as ideal as some of the other options that are available. You can provide four to six implants that are not splinted, and this is less stable than a bar. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to it, but Really, uh, we're not doing that in our practice uh, much at all because of the screw retained zirconia bridge that we're going to be talking about. One thing we did for years to replace an entire arch of teeth is utilize uh, multiple implants with a cement retained implant bridge. And the advantages to this is when you cement a implant bridge, the cement takes up casting errors. And we're going to talk about how if you cast metal, there's going to be some kind of casting errors, and this translates to stress on the implants. So the cement does take that up, but with the zirconia CAD CAM milled prosthesis, there's no distortion, and we'll talk about that. The, another advantage of a cement retained bridge over implants is that there's no screw hole to cover over. So the issue with cement retained implant prosthetics really um, centers on the retrievability of, of that prosthesis. And various clinicians use different amounts of cement and types of cement to be able to retrieve it. In my practice, when I do cement retain implant uh, bridges, I utilize a permanent cement because my feeling is that micro movement in the prosthesis can cause macro movement and implant failures and prosthetic failures. Another disadvantage to cement retain implant prosthetics is that cement can get into the sulcus. There are repair issues uh, because it's not as e easily retrievable. Uh, that can be negated, but it is an issue. And there's also a large problem if part of a full arch bridge loosens and the other part doesn't, uh, where do you go from there? So that retrievability uh, does become an issue if it does loosen. Here's a case that I did of a patient that came in with a bilateral tooth borne uh, partial. And I extracted the teeth and I placed about 12 implants. And I did bilateral sinus grafting. and the patient has a wonderful cement retained prosthesis, but look at all the time, money, and energy that went into creating this. Um, I believe with what we're doing now with the zirconia option, we can do this with less implants, uh, less chance of prosthetic failure, uh, less surgery, 
and I think it's a better choice for the patient. Here's another case I did. Um, patient came in with a failing maxillary prosthesis. After extraction of the teeth atraumatically, there was quite a bit of bone loss, so we grafted this uh, using DFDBA putties. We did some sinus grafting, and we placed 12 implants and, and gave the patient a wonderful cement retained porcelain fused metal prosthesis. But look at all the energy and money and time that went into this to create this second molar occlusion. We're going to show you an option here uh, with the zirconia CAD CAM uh, screw retained bridge that we feel offers a better, a better option. The fourth option to replace a patient's entire arch of teeth is to utilize a hybrid screw retained bridge. And the advantages to an acrylic hybrid bridge is that it's certainly better than a denture. Um, it's not removable. It's better than not having teeth. And it can be removed and replaced. The disadvantages to a hybrid bridge is that it's plastic. Um, you can get first molar occlusion, but that is a cantilever. Uh, there is quite a bit, according to the literature and also from clinical results in my office, quite a bit of chipping uh, and fracturing of this acrylic. It, it does attract plaque. Uh, the debonding is quite common, and you're relegated to denture tooth molds for the aesthetics with these hybrid bridges. The last uh, disadvantage to this is that the screw holes are unesthetic uh, because of the metal framework that's underneath. So this is what we're talking about with a fixed detachable acrylic hybrid bridge. And this is a patient of ours that came in, and we did a hybrid prosthesis. We extracted these teeth, maxillary and mandible. And we did six implants between the sinuses on the maxillary arch and, and five implants between the foramen on the mandibular arch, as is taught in the literature. And you could see this prosthesis. Now, this is acrylic. When you compare this to what we're going to show you with zirconia, uh, aesthetically, um, there's many advantages to the zirconia. But the fact that it's not going to chip and stain and wear over time is a major advantage. Here's another case. A uh, patient came in with a failing prosthesis. We placed five implants on the maxillary arch, uh, five on the mandibular arch, and here is her final result. It looks wonderful. But here's the problem. Over time, acrylic will debond from the metal interface and will chip, and it has to be repaired, and it's worn down. So in our practice, we don't do these anymore. We've gotten away from acrylic bridges uh, because we feel the longevity of them uh, doesn't compare to the alternative that we're going to present today. This is a case that came in uh, that we did seven months earlier, and there's a catastrophic debonding uh, of the um, anterior teeth, which is quite upsetting for the patient and, and not really good for the practice. This is the nature of acrylic, though. The fifth option, before we get to the mild zirconia option, is a porcelain fused to metal screw retain bridge, a PFM fixed detachable. The advantages to a PFM fixed attachable is good aesthetics. Uh, it is retrievable. The disadvantages are that when they do fracture, they're difficult to repair. Oftentimes, we cannot get the aesthetics that we would want when we repair them. When you fire the porcelain, that could cause metal distortion, which is a problem. The screw hole interface between the porcelain and the metal is very susceptible to chipping, and oftentimes that screw hole is in the occlusal load area. Um, the screw holes are also unesthetic due to the metallic base uh, to the prosthesis, and also that casting inaccuracies could cause stress on the implants. And oftentimes, the answer to casting inaccuracies is to section uh, the bridge and, and do welding, uh, whether it be laser welding or traditional welding. The problem is that's a, that's a weak point in the bridge. So we're going to show you now the zirconia option, but we really feel that zirconia uh, negates all of these problems, not only for PFM screw retained prosthetics, but also for acrylic. And here is an example of what happens when you have an, a casting inaccuracy, and now that casting inaccuracy puts stress on the prosthetic parts and on the implants themselves. When you cement retain a PFM bridge, at least you don't have uh, that casting distortion be as much of a problem, although we don't feel it's as good as the zirconia option. In the literature, a porcelain fracture of screw retained prosthetics is, is quite prevalent. Um, you, you could find that in, in a literature search. And also, um, so is the casting distortion uh, for PFM bridges pertaining to implant prosthetics. Here is the unesthetic screw hole 
that is susceptible to chipping and fracturing, uh, you're dealing with an interface here. And, and you're dealing with a bond between two, two different materials. So whether it be porcelain and metal or acrylic and metal, that bond is the weak link, and oftentimes that's where the fracturing occurs, and this creates um, an unhappy patient, and, and it's not good for the practice. Here's an example of a porcelain fused to metal bridge that's chipping away uh, because of that interface. And here's the unesthetic nature of it when the screw holes are there and also chipping of the porcelain. So we're going to negate all these problems with what we feel is the future of, of prosthetic uh, tooth replacement on implants with a milled zirconia CAD cam uh, screw retained bridge. So before we get into uh, the prosthetics of that, let's talk about zirconia and what zirconia is. Uh, zirconia is a naturally occurring element. Uh, it's atomic number 40 on the periodic table, and it's a transitional metal. Zirconia occurs in nature as a mineral, and the mineral is called zircon. And when we talk about zirconia, we're really talking about what's called zirconium dioxide. Because zirconia, uh, zirconium itself, is a shiny metal and doesn't look like the zirconia that we, we use in dentistry. And what happens is the, the zirconium is, is, is mined uh, throughout the world, and then this, this mining of the sand product, basically, with zirconium in it, is now processed by a chlorination crawl process that turns um, part of that zirconium into zirconium dioxide. And this zirconium dioxide is, a, is the oxide version of that that is now used in dentistry. So when you, when you talk about uh, aluminum, for example, that's really aluminum oxide, but we call it alumina, as we do zirconia, which is zirconia dioxide. So this, this reductive chlorination process produces this white powder, and then what's done is certain um, binders and, and, and strengthening agents, such as yttrium, uh, which is another element, is mixed with the zirconia powder. And now this is now made into a ceramic uh, zirconia uh, block that is quite a bit stronger. And because of the yttria that's added to this zirconia crystals, um, there's quite a bit of strength uh, incorporated in that. And one of the benefits of zirconia, and why zirconia is so strong, is because it undergoes something called transformation toughening when there's any kind of fracture stress on it. And it's because of the yttrium that allows this um, non-propagation of cracks in zirconia to occur. So the zirconia uh, powder with the yttrium is formed into what's called a green uh, block that's used to mill uh, dental prosthetics. And this green block is pre-sintered and it, it is actually larger than the final product. So what we do is we, we take this this zirconia pre-sintered block, we mill uh, a tooth out of it or an abutment out of it, and then it's sintered further, and that final sintered product is quite a bit stronger. The advantage to using these green, softer blocks to mill is that it's easier to mill, uh, less stress on, on the burrs, and the, the shrinkage uh, of 20 to 25 percent is dependent on the company's zirconia, and it's very accurate. These blocks uh, themselves, the zirconia pre-sintered blocks, are made out of something called cold isostatic pressing, where it is evenly pressed into these different patterns that the milling machine uh, can now uh, mill into different prosthetics. So here is the machine, a machine that creates these, these cylinders, and there's many different companies out there that make these zirconia um, cylinders that you can make now uh, crowns and different uh, dental processes out of. Um, each company that manufactures these, these zirconia cylinders has a proprietary uh, mixture of materials and, and types of, of uh, fillers in there that allow for different strength. So there's a lot of companies, for instance, um, that, that are out of China, that are not FDA approved, that are making these, and you have to be careful. Now, once this zirconia is made, different uh, dental uses can be, can be had from it. Um, this is a, an Im implant. This is um, the steroid implant, for example, a disease system that's S FDA approved that are made out of the zirconia. Uh, abutments can be made out of it, uh, crowns, uh, bridges, and then this is the full contour zirconia 
prosthesis that we'll be talking about today, that's screw routine. So there's different options that come out of this. If you compare yttria stabilized zirconia to Procera and other types of zirconia and alumina uh, disilicates, there's a much stronger fracture toughness to it and much more flexural uh, strength if you look at uh, in comparison to these other options. So the zirconia that we're talking about is yttria um, stabilized zirconia and it's quite strong. The company that we've been using in our practice for our zirconia um, is a company called Zirconzon and they're out of Italy. Uh, they've been around for quite a few years and they make a zirconia called Pretau uh, zirconia, Pretau, and I'll show you that in a second. What I like about Zirconzon is, is it's really one of the only uh, companies that we found that produce a whole system uh, to create zirconia, uh, zirconia product. They have a, an incredible milling machine, a scanning machine, a sintering oven, uh, the, the zirconia itself and different shades for it and different porcelains that you can put on the zirconia to cover to color the, the gingiva and also the tooth surface itself if you need to. So this is the Pratao zirconia from Zirconzon and it's quite aesthetic. Not only are the teeth quite aesthetic but the gingiva is also quite aesthetic and you'll see that the hardness of this rivals any other uh, prosthesis out there and it really doesn't chip. Enrico Steger is the owner of Zirkenzan and he's quite passionate. I recommend going to their website. You're going to see some incredible uh, products that they've done over the years through different clinicians using their products. Um, so we're talking about the Pertau Dental Implant Bridge. This is what we've been doing in our practice and we're quite happy with it. What is it? It is a CAD CAM milled zirconia screw retain bridge. It's impervious to chipping and staining and wear, unlike acrylic and porcelain. There's no acrylic involved with it. We have customized tooth shapes that we can utilize, not limited to molds, as a hybrid bridge is. It resolves all previous problems of hybrid bridges and screw retained PFMs, and it's been used in Europe successfully for the past uh, five or more years. The only disadvantages to it is that it's uh, CAD CAM produced, so certain equipment is needed for it. Uh, the technique we're utilizing basically offers uh, first molar occlusion, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. So there's our, there are cantilevering design um, issues that we have to look at. It is impervious to chipping. It will not warp when it's created because it's not cast. It's milled. Uh, we can customize the tooth shapes and shades. The screw holes are covered aesthetically. The screw holes, which is often the area of, of PFM screw retaining prosthetics and, and acrylic screw retaining prosthetics that chip, they won't chip. There's no staining to the product or wear. And the, the workup prosthetically is very similar to what you've been doing um, with hybrid bridges or even with bar overdentures, the same steps. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it's quite aesthetic. It's quite durable. And uh, this is the Pertau Zirconia Bridge. The gingival shades are customized. And there are different ways to attach this uh, to the implant. In, in Europe and in certain places in the States, they're, using, uh, they're not using a metal interface. In our office, we use a titanium interface between the implant and the zirconia bridge itself. This can be used with, with any implant system, pretty much. Um, it, it can be used with external hex implants or internal hex implants. And the aesthetics are, are just wonderful. One of the things that we can do is create um, the, the bridge to be quite cleansable. Uh, it can be flossed, it can be water picked, and zirconia itself is quite kind to tissue. Uh, it's different than, different than uh, plaque attraction of acrylic and even some PFM bridges. One of the questions I'm often asked is how does the zirconia wear the opposing teeth? Well, there's not a lot of studies on it, but the studies that are out there show that the Zirconia, especially the Pertau zirconia, wears opposing dentition less than porcelain. And this could be found doing a literature search. This is the milling machine from Zirkenzan. This is the, um, the M5 system. Quite a robust milling machine. Uh, instead of changing burrs, the hand pieces um, actually have their own burr on it. We have, a five, we have their five axis milling machine, the M5. This is their scanner. And this machine is built incredibly well. It's, it's a very robust machine, uh, very dependable. 
And you can see here is one of the hand pieces with a specific burr on it, and this is the uh, puck of zirconia, which comes in different sizes. And what we do is we'll, we'll scan the prosthesis, uh, the temporary prosthesis, and we'll design the final prosthesis uh, via a CAD CAM uh, process. So that's the basic background of the zirconia uh, screw retaining bridge. Now let's talk about the treatment planning aspects of it and, and what's involved with creating that for our patients. Well, as I mentioned earlier, when we look at a case like this, we're really weighing the cost difference between uh, providing the Pertow bridge, for example, and other choices that are available and how long that'll be there. Um, if we were to place 12 implants and obtain second molar occlusion utilizing uh, bilateral sinus grafting and, and, and bone grafting, the cost is going to be uh, sometimes um, quite a bit more than if we were to place six implants, for instance, here and have a cantilevered molar. So we find that in combination with the zirconia pr uh, prosthesis itself, it's really our go-to uh, full arch replacement in our office. So some of the things we're thinking about when we treat implant is what is the five-year survival rate of the remaining teeth um, or more? What is the cost comparison? What are the aesthetic advantages that this Pertow bridge will offer when trying to save teeth? And there's a point that where you have to ask the patient, are you better off taking those teeth out and just really starting over? You want to ask the patient and, and talk to them about how compliant they've been um, because you know, it's really going to be hard for a patient to change their habits all of a sudden. We look at the age of the patient and the health of the patient. We also look at the bite relationship and see if by creating a whole new occlusal scheme with, with this zirconia bridge, um, can we do that at less cost and do a more favorable uh, occlusal relationship. And then the final question we'll ask the patient and discuss with them is, are they ready for um, full arch tooth replacement? Because that's a big step for, for a lot of patients and some patients uh, are not ready to, to let go of their teeth. From a surgical standpoint, we're certainly looking at any uncontrolled diseases. Uh, we want to look at if the, if the patient is pregnant or not, and we're certainly considering smoking status, uh, whether or not the patient's on bisphosphonates and, and other uh, medical uh, considerations. So this is our basic treatment sequence at, at Tischler Dental. And what we're going to do first is work up the patient, uh, gather information, uh, take impressions, f uh, do photos, go over informed consent forms, do a CAT scan. And then we're going to talk about the surgical aspects of delivering um, treatment with the Pertow bridge. And then we're going to uncover the implants. We'll talk about that. We're going to show you how we take our impressions. We're going to talk about the provisionalization aspects, not only um, at the time during implant healing, but also during um, after uncovery with a plastic uh, acrylic temporary and, and what we do uh, in relationship to that. And then we'll talk about the final uh, delivery of the Pertow bridge. The basic steps uh, that we offer our patients uh, during this process is we're, we're going to create an immediate denture for the patient when we're replacing an entire arch. And we're going to do a duplicate wax up of that denture. And the reason we do a duplicate wax up is so that we can iron out the midline, the angulations, the occlusion, and the aesthetics, and be able now to scan that duplicate wax up and turn that into the, the acrylic um, provisional, the PMMA, and the final product. And I'll show you those steps in a minute. By the way, um, any information on this and our laboratory can be found at www.zrbridge.com. That's like zirconia bridge, zrbridge.com. And that'll get you to the Tischler Dental Laboratory website. So after we deliver the immediate denture and the implants heal for three to four months, we do an open tray impression. We then provide through the laboratory a verification jig. Uh, we do a delivery of the PMMA uh, temporary, and then we do the final portal delivery. So these are the basic, basic steps. The steps we utilize in our office uh, are these, and they're, they're quite regimented. Uh, we account for the amount of time we need. We account for the steps that are involved. And there's some variability to this depending on the case. One of the things when we treat and plan this is we're looking at the anterior posterior spread because the anterior most implant and posterior most implant will determine how far we can cantilever 
uh, this process is back. According to Mish uh, and his textbook, um, you don't want to go beyond 2.5 this AP spread in ideal conditions. What we try to do is really um, deliver a one-tooth cantilever uh, when we do these processes. Some of the things we're considering uh, when we're determining this AP spread is the bite force of the patient, uh, what's on the opposing arch, how angled the distal implants are. We want to allow enough restorative space uh, for the material height and width because this is where we're going to get our bulk of the zirconia. We look at the width and length of the implants, especially the distal ones, to support this. And then the amount of material around the distal implant is quite important for cantilever strength. The screw hole size uh, we want to make minimal, so we have maximum zirconia for strength. And we want to place these implants lingual um, where we can because th that's where the screw holes are going to come out and we'd rather not them not come out uh, to the facial uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. If they are facially inclined, we can use uh, multi-unit abutments, which we do. The goal is to go one tooth distal. So here's an example showing the important area for the cantilever because this is where we want to maximize thickness the most so that we have a strong cantilever. So some of the things that we do to maximize this, this, this cantilever area is, number one, using the CAT scan uh, that we take is at surgery, uh, reduce as much bone as possible while maintaining the longest implant length uh, that we can. Sometimes we can open the vertical dimension, which will allow for increased thickness. Uh, we'll reduce uh, tissue thickness if we, if we can. And also, um, if we can alter the opposing arch, that will also gain uh, prosthetic space for this uh, cantilever area. This is a study showing a cantilever with zirconia. And this study, um, which is on our lab website, shows that they, they, they're verifying that they need more than 5.28 millimeters of height um, at least that for a, for a cantilever. And in our office, we try to get a lot more than that. We want about 10 to 12 millimeters of, of thickness of prosthetic space, but that's certainly a lot less than 15 to 20, which a hybrid uh, bridge needs um, or a bar overdenture. We utilize CAT scans in the office. We have an ICAT machine, and I've been doing that for the last uh, 10 years. And by taking a CAT scan, uh, what we can do is basically plan the lingual position of the implants and we'll do a CAT scan prior to tooth extraction to get a general idea of the bone that's available. It also helps us uh, to see how we're going to provisionalize the case. So the CAT scan is quite helpful with that. Here's another case showing on the mandible um, where we're able to place implants distal to the foramen if we want to load implants from a provisional standpoint. Sometimes we'll do that. Uh, but the CAT scan is crucial in this process for us on many levels. One of the key questions uh, that, we, that we ask and answer is how are we going to provisionalize the patient during um, the time where the implants are healing? If it's going to be a two-stage process or if it's going to be an immediate load situation. Well, the general concepts are in the maxillary arch, uh, we're delivering mostly, uh, most of the time an immediate denture if the patient can tolerate it. And that's our first choice because that allows us to do a veloplasty, uh, load the implants at two stage, and it really depends on bone quality and if the quantity is there. Sometimes we'll utilize certain teeth with a fixed provisional, but it's difficult on the maxillary arch because we're trying to place implants in the pre-maxilla area and we want to have full control uh, to, a, to do a veloplasty there. And we can't do that sometimes when we're relying on teeth for a provisional. On the, mand on the mandible um, arch, mandibular arch, we want to avoid a denture if possible. So we're really trying to utilize teeth temporarily uh, for provisionals if possible. But we're also loading implants immediately or loading a combination of teeth and implants uh, at times also. So here's a case where the pa a patient came in with teeth that were um, hopeless. And on the mandible, we decided to provisionalize this case using uh, the distal molars and one bicuspid. And then do a, a tripodal provisional while these implants are healing two stage. As I said, sometimes we will do a combination of teeth and implants. Uh, on the maxillary arch here, we are doing an um, immediate denture. 
uh, and the implants were done as a two-stage procedure. This is the mandible, these are the teeth, and this is the provisional. And this is there for about four months, and it works quite well. In this case, uh, we actually utilize an implant with, with a uh, peak plastic abutment and a tooth. And the patient had a shortened uh, a dental arch for that three or four month period while healing. Sometimes we'll lower the implants immediately. Here's a maxillary case where the patient came in with a fixed bridge. And I placed implants uh, lingual in the extraction sites after doing a veloplasty. And we actually took an impression at the time of surgery. This is just showing how I got distal uh, to, the, to the sinuses. And this is the technique we use. And we take an open tray impression and we create a model. And then my laboratory creates a screw retained uh, provisional that we delivered at the time of surgery. Here's what the implants looked like, looked like four months later. Uh, no bone loss. These implants have been splinted. And then we'll do a soft tissue pickup at four months, create a new uh, soft tissue model, and then we'll use this PMMA now to scan for the final Pratau prosthesis, which I'll show you in a minute. This is the, um, still the provisional. Surgically, when we place implants in this fashion, <clears throat> whether it be immediate load or not, the general principles that we're following are an aseptic protocol. We're using a CT um, scan and we're not using guides. And I'll show you why I don't use guides in a minute. Basically, mid-crestal incisions, full thickness reflection. Uh, we undergo, uh, we perform a veloplasty as determined by the CAT scan and the prosthetic workup. So we have enough prosthetic space and we also don't have the junction uh, between the, the uh, zirconia bridge and, and the smile line. And we place the implant as distal as possible towards the sinuses and the mental foramen with slight angulation. And when I do these maxillary and mandibular cases together, my general uh, concept is to move pretty much as fast as possible for the patient's uh, comfort and, and get in and get out and get the implants in. But thanks to the CAT scan, we can do that. We get primary closure, of course. Uh, we use a full aseptic protocol in the practice. So here's a case uh, where the patient had these teeth that we're going to convert to a maxillary and mandibular um, Pratau bridge. And the CAT scan shows that the tooth position's here, so we have adequate bone on the maxillary arch to go lingual. And I find uh, more often than not, I would say probably 95% of the cases where I'm doing extractions and placement, that I can find bone on the lingual. And I don't need a guide for that, because once these teeth are atraumatically extracted, I can visually see uh, where I want to place the implants, and as long as I'm going lingual, we're fine. Here's what it looks like as a close-up on the cross-sectional view. And I'm basically going to do a biloplasty to this point, place the implants lingual, the screw hole will now be lingual, and everything just works out fine. Uh, if there's any residual socket left, we'll graft that. I use demineralized freeze-dry bone putties, and we just simply place that in there and fill these areas in. But here's the plan to place these six implants towards the lingual. And as I say, 95% of the time, uh, I'm able to do this, partially because there's good cortical bone on this lingual area, and it seems to work out real well. So here's the abiloplasty in this case. Take away a few millimeters of bone, and now we're going to place these implants towards the lingual of the socket. We're not trying to just obliterate the socket. We want these inclined lingually. So some of the principles are, on the maxilla, find the distalmost implant near the sinus first. That's what I do. I want to see how distal I can go. Then I go uh, to the incisal foramen and go, uh, go distal to the incisal foramen on both sides of it and try to get as close as I can to that. So now I've placed on the maxillary arch my distal implants. Now I've placed my mesial implants. Now I'm just going to find space between the distal and the mesial implants and place um, the, the, the third and, and, and fourth implant in between. So we're going to place implants lingual for ideal screw hole positioning. Uh, I undersize my osteotomy uh, preparation so I get good fixation of the implants. I use uh, DFDBA putties um, in these sites that are, that are still exposed and, and, and graft those quite predictably. And one of the keys to getting the implant in the lingual position is to use a sharp pointed initial burr, uh, whether it be a two millimeter burr or less, to get a good perch 
because that bone is very hard, uh, that cortical bone is very hard. So I want to make sure I'm lingual to these sites. And as I say, I do not use guides unless the patient's medically compromised and there's so much abundant bone uh, that I can do it. But I don't need it. I actually want to have the flexibility uh, once the tissue is reflected. I want to be able to do my abiloplasty um, as has been determined by the CAT scan. And if I do abiloplasty, the guide's not going to fit at that point anyway. So unless the ridge is not going to be altered at all, the guide is pretty much useless in my opinion. I'm just going lingual. And I also don't want to commit to an area with an osteotomy preparation that has low bone density and take up um, good bone that I need. So here's a case that we did use a guide on. And here's a guide that was planned uh, with the CAT scan. And we're going to go in and do our osteotomy preparations through the guide. And then we're going to punch the tissue uh, almost flapless and place the implants. And that's not done very often in my office. Um, we just we don't find that, that there's often that much abundant bone. And oftentimes, I need to do uh, aviloplasty in order to gain prosthetic space. So at that point, the guide's going to be pretty much useless. So after we place implants, whether it be um, a two-stage uh, procedure or um, loading some of the implants, which we do, but we're going to do, with a two-stage procedure, we're going to do um, reline of the immediate denture with CoSoft. And then the patient's going to leave with an immediate denture. Here we are utilizing the CoSoft. After the implants heal for a period of about three to four months, we're going to uncover uh, the implants. And w when I uncover implants, when I'm doing a two-stage procedure, there's a couple of principles that I follow. I try to visualize where the implants are. I'm going to emplace the incision to uncover lingual to where the implants are so I can kind of spread uh, the keratinized tissue to the facial. We're going to reduce the palatal tissue at uncovery so that I only utilize a three millimeter healing cap and I don't want to have the implants too far under the gum. And then I'm going to use uh, suturing techniques that approximate the tissue at the desired height. So here's an example of uncovery, of placing the implants facial to these healing caps. And now I'll reduce some of this tissue on the palatal. And notice that I don't have primary closure. This is very similar to doing perinatal surgery. Here's a case where you can see the implants are somewhat facial where there's mucosal tissue here. And what I'll do is I'll move this tissue to the facial, reduce the tissue on the palatal, and then I'll reduce it here so you can see the difference. Here it is sticking above the healing caps, and here it is uh, slightly below. And here is the patient as she leaves, and then here's what it looks like uh, two weeks later, where you can see we have good healing uh, around those healing caps, and now we're ready uh, for impressions. So we've placed the implants, and I've showed you the techniques that I utilize. We've uncovered the implants, and the next thing we're going to do is reline uh, the denture that was sitting on the tissue now with CoSoft once again on these healing abutments. And very simply, we're going to reline it, and now the denture has a better retention because it's sitting on the healing caps that have healed. So the next step after um, relining the denture on the healing caps and uncovering is to take impressions. The technique that we utilize to take impressions is something that's been taught in, in many, many textbooks. It's an open tray impression. And what we're doing is we're, we're creating a, a, a stent of these impression copings us, using floss in the beginning and then placing dual cure composite. We're going to then section the composite after it heals, uh, place some more composite there to avoid any shrinkage of this to distort, distort the impression copings. Now, the tray that we utilize for our open tray impressions for the last six months with great success is the Mira tray by Hager Workin. This is sold through a lot of dental dealers in the States. I believe it's a German company. But what I like about this tray is it allows the screws to kind of stick through this cellophane matrix and it contains the material in a very nice way. It gives you a very, very accurate impression in a very simple way. So this is what the tray looks like. Uh, so we don't really use custom trays anymore because this tray has so many advantages. Uh, we use a polyether material and we get a very stable impression. We place the analogs on there. And now a working model is going to be made in our laboratory, soft tissue model. 
and we're going to start the process of making the verification jig. So we've uncovered, we've taken impressions, and now we're going to create a verification jig. And we're going to do this in a kind of a, a neat way using a heated uh, acrylic rod. And we, we basically take the titanium interfaces and we put them onto the rod with, with, some, um, with some acrylic. And we create a radiographic verification jig that the clinician can now uh, verify on a, on a panoramic x-ray or PAs. The next thing after the verification jig is to index the wax up uh, that we did in the beginning onto the implants. And this can be done in various ways. One of the ways we're utilizing is to use a few of the implants uh, and be able to verify uh, not only those two or three implants, but also in the areas where there isn't an interface. And basically now we have a very accurate verification jig. But there are various ways to do this. So we now take our model and we take the verification wax up in the mouth that we've, that we've done a, um, a, pick up, a verification pickup on and we create an accurate position of the tooth position, midline, lip line, and occlusion. We're now going to create a screw retain acrylic temporary. And this, this temporary is made from, once again, from the uh, um, wax up that we do, had a duplicate of the denture made. And we create a screw retain provisional using denture teeth um, with the interfaces on the model. And this, the patient will now wear for about uh, two to three weeks. Our goal is for them to wear this and do a verification with the doctor of the final lip position, phonetics, occlusion, and aesthetics. In our lab, um, oftentimes we'll actually scan this, this uh, prosthesis so we can now create the permanent uh, zirconia bridge from this. Or we also have our clients take impressions of the PMMA in the mouth and then we'll pour that up and, and use that for a scan. So we've created this, this acrylic uh, screw retain provisional. The patient now wears that for three weeks. This allows us to really get an idea of what the patient's gonna, gonna feel about it, how it's gonna look, and how it's gonna function in the mouth. Here's another example. Here's another example. And at this point, the patient's quite happy. They now have something that's not removable, uh, it's stable, and we like to say this is like, this is like the permanent uh, version of a lot of uh, steps out there, but this is really only our temporary. We're now gonna go to the final portal. And what we do is we take that PMMA and we scan it. And what we do is we marry that with the interface positions uh, in the software this is the Zirkenzon scanner, and this is the Zirkenzon milling machine. And we take this design, and we actually um, design it, and then we mill out a zirconia version of the acrylic temporary. You can see all the CAD CAM designing we do here. And now we then virtually place that into the zirconia puck, and the milling machine now mills that out. Now, I mentioned earlier that the pre-sintered zirconia is 20 to 25 percent larger uh, than the final product. So my lab now will take this, this initially um, milled zirconia, and here is a maxillary mandibular arch, and we will now apply stains to this. So we can now intrinsically stain this prior to the final sintering. So here's what the stains look like, and we now put this in the sintering oven, and this sinters for about 10 to 12 hours at about 1,500 degrees Celsius and shrinks between 20 and 25%. The Pertau zirconia, I believe, uh, shrinks 22% exactly. So we apply these stains from Zirkenzon, and not only in the tooth areas, but also in the gingival areas, because you want to obtain ideal aesthetics in the gingival areas. After this is sintered, we will now uh, apply low fusing uh, porcelains to gain uh, aesthetics in the gingival areas, and then in some highly demanding aesthetic cases, we will actually apply some of the Zirkenzon porcelain on the facial areas in the anterior non-functional, in non-functional areas. But you can see that we've obtained uh, ideal aesthetics here, and here's an example of, of a screw hole that kind of um, came out the facial, but what's nice about the zirconia is that if you put composite here, that's gonna blend in 
and, and be almost indetectable. Same thing here. A little spot there that could be filled in with composite. So this is full contour zirconia here. This is a B1 shade, I believe. And you can see that we have ideal aesthetics. This will not chip, this will not stain, and this will be there for uh, many, many years to come. This process can also be done on um, less implants than a full arch. This is an example of a three-unit bridge, screw retain, with the Pertau, um, zirconia, and porcelain. So here's a case where we started. I showed you this earlier. And here's the final uh, maxillary mandibular Pertau. This is a temporary filling here right now. This is that delivery. But you can see um, we have an exact, exact duplicate of the PMMA and the patient has something that uh, will be there for many, many years to come as opposed to acrylic and a PFM. Here's another case. Look at the occlusion here. This is a good example of being able to change occlusion. We did the maxillary arch here. But unlike acrylic uh, or porcelain, this will not chip, stain, or break. Another case, maxillary mandibular. Same thing, this is a temporary delivery, but we have good aesthetics and good prosthetic longevity here. So you've seen the whole process of, of how we basically, uh, my techniques for placing the implants, how we've utilized a, a wax up of the provisional, and then we, we verify that and we scan that and we create a PMMA, screw retain provisional, and from there, we create the final prosthesis. So it's a stepping stone process that gets us to this point that allows us to have such a predictable uh, workflow. This is before, and this is the final portal, and you can kind of appreciate how we got there. We, we allow cleansable embrasure areas here. Uh, you're looking at some of the um, zirconzon porcelain on the gingival areas here. This is full contour zirconia. And once again, this is impervious to chipping, staining, and wear. And it will not wear the opposing teeth any more than porcelain does. In fact, the literature shows that it's actually less. Radiographically, it has a unique look to it, but it's very radio-opaque. And, and this, is the, this is the look that you get when you do a, a panoramic x-ray, for instance. In our practice, we just feel this is an ideal service to the patient. Um, this is all we're doing at Tischler Dental and it's being produced at Tischler Dental Laboratory. And we certainly invite any clients to use our lab. Uh, the longevity of this, um, it, it's been used in Europe for five or more years with great success. Dr. Roas is uh, one of the only ones that have, that have published on this. Um, I will shortly. And he's got uh, case studies that go back uh, three years with nothing but success on these cases. And this can be found by doing a uh, search on uh, PubMed. Once again, it's the screw holes that are just impervious to chipping. And the hardness of the zirconia, the yttria zirconia, stabilized zirconia, is what allows this to happen. Further information can be found at uh, www.zrbridge.com. Uh, this is our Tischler Dental office and laboratory in Woodstock, New York. And we certainly welcome uh, clients. This is our team. Um, always available for any kind of surgical advice. Uh, my associate, Dr. Patch, is available as a prosthetic consultant, and so is uh, Jose Echeverry is our lab director. And we have a website with all the forms on it and lots of information at zrbridge.com. Uh, we've advertised this in, in dental journals in the U.S., and we're um, quite proud to deliver this to our clients. Another service we offer is conversion of failing hybrid bridges um, with a website called hybridtoprotow.com where we could take a failing uh, prosthesis and convert that to a zirconia prosthesis um, in a short time. On the website are various uh, articles and literature on this to give you more information. Our lab slips are available. And then lastly, I'll say uh, this is a brochure that we use in our office. Um, we have a marketing program that's on the website too, if you're interested in marketing this to your, to your area. And we have models that are available uh, to either loan or purchase, because these models are really the best way for your patients to, to, to hold this and, and you to see what's, what this is about. 
The last thing I'll say is we do have a course that we're giving, uh, the first ones in January, uh, January 11th and 12th, 2013 in Woodstock, New York. And information on that can be found either at zrbridge.com or at pertowcourse.com. I want to thank Dental XP one more time, and I appreciate your attention. And I'm also available if you have any questions via email. And that email address can be found on the laboratory website, zrbridge.com. Thank you very much. So, Mike, that was really quite remarkable. I think all of you will be excited just being able to first see it. And then, of course, because of XP, you have the opportunity to go back, as I have, and review certain aspects that you thought you got, but you didn't get completely um, during the time process. I know some of the questions that will come up, Mike, because, you know, for dentists at large, the first thing everybody wants to know, and all our patients want to know, they will want to know two things. How much does it cost, and how quickly can I get this done? Those are kind of the two big deals in, you know, just the general arena, everybody's arena. So I'm sending you a case. What is the net cost, you know, to me as a the dentist. So well, what we've adapted is uh, as a universal fee uh, of it's it's forty eight hundred dollars, and what that includes is a if you it, it depends how you provisionalize it, but if you're going to provisionalize the case with an immediate denture, it's forty eight hundred dollars. That includes an immediate an immediate denture, um, a plastic version of the final um, zir zirconia product, a screw retained a, a provisional, and the final product. The only additional costs are the metal inter the titanium interfaces. And if you're using um, a platform, a Zimmer platform or a Nobel platform, it's about $35 each. So it's, you're under $5,000 for everything. Com Super complete nuts. and delivered. Completely delivered. And what we've done in our office, we adapt a universal fee for the treatment. That includes uh, extractions. I just did a case, uh, I just finished a case this afternoon where I extracted about 10 or 12 teeth. And then I ended up grafting the sites where the, where the teeth were extracted. I placed, I placed actually eight, eight implants. Normally it's six. Fee's the same. It's $28,000 for the patient. You know, we don't nickel and dime this. This is just what we do. So what do you do? That's four, you do eight. Your, your basic fee is going to be the same. That's what I do. That's yeah. And I use, um, I use some different putties, uh, Dynablast or Regeniform, and I place it in the site. And in this case, we, we placed an immediate denture, got primary closure, and the, and the patient will wear that now for about three months. And then I'll uncover. And in the lecture, I showed how I uncover. It's, it's the same steps. And so for is. the attendees, then, you, you're going to make that good. Whether I send you a case with four in or eight in, our lab cost is essentially much the same. Our lab costs are based on uh, six implants on the maxilla and five on the bottom. Um, and I have to talk to Jose. I think there, there might be an additional fee for extra implants. Um, in my office, though, that's, that's what I do for my patients. I mean, talking about number of implants, you and I were talking about the article recently in Jomi that came out um, mm -hmm. about all on three by the Oliver brothers. I mean, what are your all perspectives on, on that? And of course, they're using you know, essentially pretile bridges or a variation on the thing. They are. It was based on all zirconia bridges. They showed, I think, 20 cases. Uh, and they most of them were all on three or all on four with large ponic areas, you know. In our office, we try, we try to not have ponic areas and maybe a small cantilever one tooth. But it shows that the flexural strength of the zirconia, um, it had 100% success in five years for implant, um, no bone loss, no prosthetic failures, it shows, you know, to do that on three implants and have that kind of a success rate is a real testimonial to the product. Amazing. What, what particular implants were they using? Or was it a variation? I, I am not sure what brand they're using. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but interestingly, they also, they don't use, I know them, they don't use the metal interfaces, uh, which I, I like. Um, but they also use an external hex system. And I think if you use an external hex system, uh, you don't really have to use yeah. interfaces. 
But with an internal hex, we're using non-engaging uh, titanium interfaces that are that are bonded to the zirconia. With uh, we use Ibrachlor's, well, um, you know, bonding um, above the cement. Yeah, it, 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 it works remarkably well. The data on that is actually really remarkable. I, I personally would, would agree with you that the the metal interface is a key component to this. I mean, having done it without metal interfaces, I, I think that's very, very key. Mike, you do a great job on, on explaining the sequencing of this. And I think that's, you know, the last question for anybody. You know, from start to finish, what's my anticipated time frame? And what's the time frame before I can tell the patient that What's the time frame for me referring the case to you as the lab in between the sequential steps or the or different appointments? Yeah, I mean, the average case uh, for either one arch or two arches combined takes a little under six months in our office. I'm waiting uh, three months or so for, for implants at, for two stage. If we also do an immediate load, but I'm still waiting three months for the implants to integrate. And then by the time we deliver the, uh, what we call the PMMA, the plastic version of this, uh, that's going to be, I want the patient to wear that for about three weeks to really make sure that the patient is comfortable with phonetics and aesthetics and occlusion. And then we reproduce that basically. Um, so you're looking at, it's just under six months. So three months of, of implant healing and then another three months of, of making the prosthetics and, and we, we give you a jig try in and it comes out to be about five and a half months total. That's really great. Mike, I, I can see from Tyler that there are other questions coming in from other people. So I'm going to let you field some of those. But in the interim, really, we certainly appreciate it at Dental XP. And I know dentistry at large really values this kind of information and the rather nice way that you presented it and made it available to us. I mean, there is a learning process to Thank this, you. and we certainly like it the way you're doing it and look forward to doing many, many cases. Perhaps when we finish the case together, we'll show it up on Dental XP. That'd be great. Uh, coming from you, it means a lot. Thank you so much.